Hi, I'm Ron Marsh of Ron's Trains and Things, and tonight here on YouTube Model Builders, we're talking about the role of the NMRA in model railroading today. Tonight, I'm joined on the panel by Andy Crawford and Stephen Atwell of Midwest Model Railroad. So let's get to the discussion. Good. Hi, I'm Steve Atwell of Midwest Model Railroad, and we're sitting down tonight to discuss the role of the NMRA in the hobby today. Uh, let's start with Andy Crawford, your opinions about the NMRA in the hobby today. So I, tend to, I see a lot of controversy uh, in, the pre, in the communities around this, Facebook communities, et cetera. And people don't understand the nature of it. I feel more defensive of the NMRA. I mean, granted, so I, you wouldn't put me firmly in the camp of, yes, they're fine, et cetera. It's, they're obviously not fine. I, I feel somewhat like I do about the the supposed death of the hobby. They're, it's it's fine, but it needs adjustment. I, I do think that it come into the 21st century. As a technology advocate, I just think it's insane that they don't have a better technology presence. It's not not existing, but it should be better. But I also miss the roots of what the NMRA is there for. And I think a lot of people miss that we need them. The standards organization part of who they are, not the social circle of who they are. But the standards organization is critical. It's the reason that we're not Atlas model Railroaders or Athard or Bachman or actually for the era Taco or Barty. So... kind of defensive of them, but they do need to make some adjustments. But I'm not as negative about them. How about... Not as negative about them as... As, as I typically see. Yeah, I typically see one. Like, like in most common, most arguments, people tend to be one way or the other. They're either completely pro, they're all about the NMRA, their NMRA is the greatest thing, or they're completely negative. I see no point in the NMRA, or the NMRA, NMRA is so backwards that I have no interest in, in them. They'll be dead in, in a year. I've, I've seen both sides of it. I tend to be a little more lukewarm about it in that, sure, they need to, to modernize. And I think that they put, I think that, you know, some part of their mission statement has changed into a little bit more of a social circle side of the hobby than what I think their critical role is. Standards, standards documentation, and standards collaboration between manufacturers in space. That's critical. They've done that. They're continuing to do it. Could they do it better? Sure. But they've continued to do it. And, you know, we've got LCC. I mean, that's a very modern, very technolo technology-centric uh, standard that's being ratified and being worked with. It came out of the open source community. That, that's a great thing. They, they've done that. Now, the social circle side of what they're doing, I, I get that they're uh, antiquated in their approach. They're not near as internet savvy as they could be. They're missing a lot of opportunity, but uh, that's adjustment, not, not do away with them. I think they're critical to us. Yeah. Uh, Ron, how do you feel about the NMRA? Well, I mean, I'll confess to, to be fairly ambivalent. I, I mean, I'm an NRA member at this point. I haven't always been. Um, I think one of the real perception problems the NMRA has with a lot of people is that uh, people feel like it, it promotes a certain level of model railroad snobbery. That's kind of the social aspect in part that, that Andy was talking about before. Um and I and I get that. I, I I saw that as a as a young, brand new model railroader in some of my first experiences with local NMRA groups. And that's not the you know the national organization. You know you can't judge the whole organization by a few people. But but I I hear that a lot. I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's just an isolated incident. Uh, so uh, you know I I think I think there's a problem a problem there. Um, now I've attended, you know, a couple of conventions over the years and some train shows and, um, you know, sometimes I, I enjoy those. I, I, I don't know that I enjoy them so much for what they offer as I enjoy the opportunity to meet, you know, and hang out with other model railroaders. Um, I mean, the things that, that the model that, that the NMRA offers that people should get some value from are, are the magazine uh, the the convention and the clinics that are offered at the convention and the train show, and then the 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 support that they would get from the NMRA through standards or through the use of the library those those sorts of things, um, you know. And I I feel like you know the support end. I agree with Andy. I think those standards are 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 important. I, I think they need to work more at continually making sure that they are up to date. Um, but but I, I do think that, uh, you know, that the support both that you get through the magazine as well as what you get through the clinics at the convention could be 
could be a lot better. I think they could be a lot better. Uh, uh, I think uh, John touched on the magazine a bit. Uh, how do we feel about the magazine? I know there's been a lot of talk of the sort of worthlessness of the magazine for the past few years. Yeah, I, I would if if I were in charge, I'd kill the magazine immediately. Uh, number one, uh, I, there's plenty of people like me, plenty of people who do love paper, but I, I don't want anything on dead tree. I don't want to have to store it. It's not searchable. I'm not at all friendly to paper magazines. And if, if Model Railroader was a paper only magazine, I would have killed them many, many years before I did. I think to in their defense, I think Comic Publishing and Model Railroader has done what, what if they wanted to maintain a magazine, they should do. And that's provided in an app. Now, I understand their uh, resistance to just open it as a PDF or publish it widely. They need to control that content. I, I do understand that democratizing or distributing that content in a free way would lose some of the control and influence that they need as a standard organization and the standard bearer for the hobby. But Modern Railroad or Callback has laid the, the groundwork for how to do that. Just build an app, wrap that, wrap the uh, magazine or the subscription in that. People who want it can buy it. Uh, I possibly would if they had it in electronic format, but I don't want paper. I don't want to store it. I don't want to pack it around. I don't want to figure out what to do with it. So it's more of a nuisance for me. But if it was in a digital format, I, maybe I would consider paying that difference. As it is, I'm an NMRA member excluding the magazine for that specific reason. I just don't want the thing. I'd like right, to so, so maybe if it was a PDF behind a paywall or something that you could subscribe, you want your subscriber or yep. a member, you can get log in and uh, downloadable content. Right. Now, I think a lot of people, I think their resistance to uh, to a PDF specifically or to a file based format of any kind is that as soon as one NMRA member that kept the magazine part of the subscription could just grab it and send it to everybody they do or make it publicly available. Whereas what what callback has done with the, the magazine is they uh, with Modern Railroader and their other offerings of the magazine is put it inside of an app or inside of a web page. So you must have an account. And if you lose that account, you lose that content that uh, you lose all content at the point that you stop subscribing. So I did eventually drop my bottle railroader subscription for, for different reasons, just because I wasn't looking at it and I'd kept it for 20 years, even in the years as I was the hobby, but I can still go back now and look at all the ones right up until the point that I stopped paying for that service. So they could do that. There, there's already a model for how to do that in an electronic format. And for the people who still want paper, uh, and so I've heard on other uh, mediums on podcasts, Joe Fugit talking about him talking to the MRA about this, doing uh, JIT or just in time uh, print publication. So for the people who wanted paper, that's still a mechanism. Let them pay that cost difference for paper. I don't want it. And the storage is the biggest problem is I love the content. There's good stuff in those. And I have some, you know, plenty of really good articles that somebody at some point scanned in that was initially released in the NMRA magazine, but I have an electronic copy of it. There's some cool stuff there. I'd pay for it if they'd put it in a way that I could get to it. Well, I guess uh, you mentioned you absolutely want somebody to pay for this content and your concern of it being downloaded as a PDF and distributed. What is the, what do you think the risk behind it truly going out to the hobby as a whole really is? Well, I don't know that there's necessarily, a, okay, as far as the hobby is concerned and we're concerned, it's not a risk. It would just be a benefit. I do believe that the value they should provide to the hobby is to further propagate the hobby, to promote and prop it up. And providing that information free, I think would be great. And I think it would be achievable if it was an electronic format. But I also understand they're, they're an organization that has been funding themselves off the back of this thing for a number of years. And just opening it up and losing that potential revenue source might be a, uh, culture shock, if not an accounting department culture shock, at least initially. And I think that you could, you could ease into this. This is what I do with my corporate clients. We had, uh, when I put uh, our local hospital on Facebook and various other uh, organizations that I've uh, approached and worked with for social media campaigns, it's slow, easy steps. So none of it feels like a culture shock to them. If they would just, they could put it behind a paywall initially, distribute it in a way that they could only read it, see how that works, see how that impacted the economics of it. See if that is the revenue driver that they think it is. And if it turns out that they could promote the hobby and grow the hobby in a better way by providing it free and then recouping that, that revenue gain by the potential other NMRA members they would get, that's an approach they could figure out. They could play the economic 
you know, risk game with with some intelligent information. At the moment, I feel like they're kind of in the dark, and it's their own fault that they are. Um, you know, I, I don't think that they fully grasp social media, what potential loss it is for them. And part of that is they're in an echo chamber. Uh, the vast majority of them, what Rod was saying about the kind of clickish nature of them, keeps a, a, a large group of them that are kind of a self-promoting circle of, the, we've been doing it this way, hits that's the way we should do it because we that's the way we're doing it. And it's this little cycle that they're stuck in. And it's not bringing new blood to the hobby, at least at the rate of success that I think the opportunity is there for. I think they're missing. You know, it's a missed opportunity, missed revenue, missed missed opportunity to grow the hobby. Yeah, I want to want to back up and, and build on something that you I think you were saying, Andy, because you, you were talking about the magazine as potentially uh, a, a tool for for growing the hobby, for reaching you know new hobbyists. I, I think that's part of what you were saying. Yes, uh, and and if if the magazine were to be that kind of a tool. I think it would have to be a drastically different magazine than what they're publishing now. I agree. Uh, and what I mean, what they're publishing, and, and I'll confess, I don't take the magazine. I haven't. I haven't in years. Uh, but but when I did, um, it, it, you know, a typically, it, I mean, it was geared towards the you know the intermediate to advanced modeler. I mean, it was a high end kind of magazine. And B, because it tended to be so specialized, I would find one article that I would find interesting out of every, you know, year's worth of, of publication. That's why I stopped paying for the magazine. Right. Uh, if they want to, if they want to use it as a tool to grow the hobby, uh, they need to make an entry level magazine. Uh, and and if that were to be the case, maybe that would need to be a completely separate kind of a publication. And then you're getting into a whole different, you know, uh, can of worms. But um, but I don't think the magazine, as they publish it now, uh, is by any means going to is going to be something somebody's going to pick up. And you know, when I first got into the hobby as a young adult, one of the first things I did was I found Model Railroader magazine. And for all the good or bad that you may think of Model Railroader magazine, for somebody just getting into the hobby, it is a great tool because you can see everything from beautifully done completed layouts to very, very basic projects that you can do on your own right there. Um, you know, that that's a tool. And I don't see the NMRA magazine either being that or, or becoming that. No, I think Model Railroader definitely, Compact definitely knows their target audience. I think they fit yeah. that niche quite well. I think a lot of people uh, kind of demean that this is kind of off topic of the NMRA, but kind of demean Model Railroader. Uh, for not going into more advanced uh, subject material where RMC or, uh, uh, you know, rare model craftsman has, you know, normally existed or been expected to exist in that market. But in their defense, Model right. Order knows their audience. Uh, this beginner, early intermediate phase, advancing modeler, building their first large railroad or one of the first few rounds. Model Order is spectacular. I think they're a better even though people demean them, I think they're a better target for what the NMRA possibly should be doing in an open source, non-profit oriented way versus the for-profit MR. So there is some difference and disparity in how they should act, but it's a good target model for what they probably should be doing. As it is, I, I don't see that the NMRA is uh, encouraging new entry into the hobby in, the, in any meaningful way. And, and that's the biggest area where they could grow. And they should be like the, uh, the certifications, the whole goal of becoming an uh, MMR is, according to what I've heard from others, is that each person who becomes an MMR, it's their duty, so to speak, to to go out and further other people's advancement, certification, and potentially becoming MMRs. I find that the exact same thing happens. The exact opposite thing ha happens. They, Once a person becomes an MMR, they're much less likely to try to, you know, water down that pool of MMRs that are out there or something. But and if you don't believe that, go talk to some MMRs and tell them, hey, I'd like to pursue my MMR and see much help, how, how much help you get from them, unless you already have an extremely close personal relationship with them. Absolutely. Um, see, 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 how much, see how much help that you, you get. How would you uh, feel if I told you that the magazine actually operates at a substantial loss every year? I was going to bring that up because I don't know the statistics there, but I, I do know that, uh, that there is a serious financial loss uh, on the end of that magazine year after year. Okay. Then that doesn't explain their 
reluctance to move away from it if it's a revenue drain. And I don't see it as a net positive. And the vast majority of people that I talk to about the NMRA who do have any positive response to me about them are people who do not subscribe to the magazine. I think that is some audience that may be outside of my wheelhouse because I largely uh, collaborate with other modelers via via the internet. And I think that there's a certain part of their membership that is not internet savvy that they, that might care about that magazine, it might hurt their feelings to lose it. But the vast majority of people I talk to don't want the magazine. Most people that, that think they have a good idea about what their NMRA should do that I've heard say exactly what I did. The first thing I'd do is kill that. That's just cut that. The magazine is more than 20% of the operating expense of NMRA every year. Yeah, it does not, it does not defend that, that expense. No, it's uh, it, it operated in 2017 at a $50,000 loss. Wow. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, yes. I, I defend that initial position with much more confidence than I initially did. If I was put in charge, I'd kill the magazine. There's no question. My biggest complaint probably is where their, what their target is. I think they are, um, and one of us was saying this recently uh, that we, we were talking about this is it's a managed decline was the way I think we were you know, talking about that. That was part of the expression was that they're managing the decline in the hobby, et cetera. Uh, I think if they targeted new people, I think if they targeted other manufacturers to improve standards and, and to produce multiple standards, like the NMRA has no part in anything beyond the most entry level. Here's the bare minimum of standards. Many, many modelers think that those standards are, are the be all end all. You meet the RP25 wheel standard, you meet the whatever standard, you know, you want to lay out. And I think of them more as a, uh, a base that you can improve upon, but you must meet at least meet that base. But they say nothing to the more serious modelers where I think the hobby has so much potential to grow in the RPM space, et cetera, where like Proto 87 and the semi scale standards, they don't have any say on that at all. But if they would refocus around being a standards organization, they would have the free middle capacity to target being the best standards organization that could be. All right. I think this is a great spot for a break. I feel like we're going to talk, uh, jump into the standards discussion next, and it's going to be, a, uh, it's a good spot for a break and we should come back and talk about standards. All right, uh, we're going to jump back in here. We're talking about uh, the NMRA, and we want to touch on the standards topic. We've touched on it briefly a little bit. Uh, what do we feel the role of the NMRA is in upkeeping standards and how they're doing with it? Ron, we're going to start with you. Um, or, uh, beyond the standards that you use on your on your layout, I don't know that I'm a great expert, but I mean, uh, anybody who owns an NMRA gauge. Uh, uses NMRA standards every time you pick that thing up. Uh, the fact that we have NMRA standards are the reason why I can buy, you know, Pico track and run an Atlas locomotive and, and micro trains, uh, cars and, uh, you know, and, and, and Kato equipment and put it all on the same track and it, and it, and it runs, um, and it works together. Uh, so, you know, I, I think those standards are, are, are hugely important. Now, I, I do think that there are some of them that, that need to be uh, reviewed and, and updated a little more regularly than we have. I know it's been it's, some of those standards have, have stood and not even been considered for decades in some cases. Um, but uh, and, and also, you know, I know when you get into the more technical ends of the hobby, which is where the hobby is now, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't have, you know, DCC uh, working the way that it does, you know, code decoders that that can function with, you know, equipment from other companies uh, without those standards that have said, OK, here is how you have to make this thing work and it's going to be compliant so that they can play nicely together. How would we, I, this is a topic that's come up in discussion before. Um, why, why is it on the consumer to create those or to pay for those standards? Why don't the manufacturers get together and fund those standards across manufacturing? It, it could have been that way. I know that it is that way in the technology world, for example, consumers don't pay, um, homage to a standards organization to create uh, uh, Ethernet standards for net computer networking or to, for the USB standard or for the HDMI standard. 
those are manufacturer consortiums that get put together to build and ratify that particular standard. It could have been done that way. The reason that it was not originally, or at least my instincts as to why it was not done that way originally is because the hobby did not come out of a vendor uh, produced market. It became out of a bunch of hobbyists who were scratch building most of what they had. And, and he had said it had to be a bottom up architecture. Now, I personally think that the bottom up architecture is better for us. I think that us paying into those standards organizations uh, should, I don't, I'm not, I can't defend that it does or does it currently, but it should be that we would have a closer relationship with that standards organization that helps produce the standards that manufacturers have to meet. And if that model worked as well as I think the NMRA once did, and as well as I think the NMRA should and could work today, we could have input as a, you know, as a community, and it's a much more democratic way of producing the standards that we're, you know, basically going to need to subscribe to. All right, and you touched on LCC earlier, uh, coming back to LCC, the, the standards of LCC, do you believe, or do you know that those standards came from a manufacturer versus came from a consumer? Well, they started they came from a manufacturer. Well, they started with an open source. Uh, there can be an argument made today that we don't need the NMRA for standards because the open source software world, the guys who did Linux and the software that runs on Arduino and even the hardware that is Arduino, much of the electronics and technology world today is built on open source standards where the community itself um, democratically produced the standard. And, and, and there could be a model for that being the way it would work. And if the NMRA did cease to exist, that would be what we would have to do. Um, I think that the, the LCC uh, protocol started from the open LCB community, which is an open source world of software developers that works much like open source world worlds of software developers typically work. And the NMRA just decided to work on top of that and ratify the LCC standard based on the open LCB project. Uh, do we need that or not? There, there's an argument to be made that we do and we don't. You could go both ways on that. But the fact that they do it did work for DCC. I mean, what's that, 25, maybe 30 years almost? Uh, they produced a standard that had a lot of legs that is still growing and expanding with new capable features today on a protocol that was way before the internet or even computers in most people's homes. So. I think big organizations can typically have the foresight and, uh, you know, motivation to push things along where community driven organizations don't always have enough influence. Okay. Uh, touching on that. Yeah. Uh, big organizations also have been known to also be incredibly sluggish no in, doubt. in doing the same. Now that's a problem specifically with open LCC. Um, or, or with LCC. I don't personally think I, I initially thought that I was holding out for LCC to be truly ratified to use on my layout. I won't. Uh, they were too slow and better technology uh, has came along that I intend to use on my own layout. So even my own personal impact is that they work toward LCC ratification too slowly. Now, I think they could get away with that 30 years ago when DCC came into the market. I don't think they can stay that slow today. And even if they could for LCC, whatever the next thing to come along is, they will have to move faster or they will be irrelevant. The companies will not wait for the standards organization the way that technology companies don't wait for the government to step up to regulate. They just can't move fast enough and they're not nimble to move fast enough. But I think they could fix it and I really, really think they should fix it. I think what you what you refer to there is, um, is a systemic problem that also relates to the whole issue of embracing, you know, the internet and, you know, and that we were talking about earlier. Uh, I, I think it's a mindset that uh, is common to people of the age of many of the people who have driven the NMRA for a very long time. Yes. All right. I think that's a great uh, point. We should take a little break here. Uh, we'll come back next week and talk about, uh, we'll continue this discussion on the NMRA. Hi, this is Big Bill coming to you from YouTube Model Builders. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion tonight that we presented to you. Uh, please tune in next Friday after 3 p.m. when we will post another discussion on Model Railroad Views. Thank you for watching. Take care. God bless, and we'll see you on the radio.